Welcome to our series on St. Matthew's Gospel. We are looking at Matthew chapter 27 and we are in the middle of the trial of Jesus before the world power in Rome. Uh, and that, that power is represented by Pilate who lives in Jerusalem. Pilate absolutely hated the Jews and he was famous for crucifying them. And he crucified them because he despised them utterly. He wouldn't dream of living in Jerusalem. He hated the place. He lived in Caesarea. And he only came to Jerusalem uh, when he absolutely had to come. Now, he had to come for this uh, event. Uh, and so, where did he stay in Jerusalem? Well, we're going to find that in order to um, meet Pilate, Jesus has to go and meet him on his territory. Pilate would never go out of his grounds to meet any Jew of any rank. So we're told that Jesus had to go to the Praetorium. Now, Pilate is called the Praetor in Latin. So the house he stays in is therefore the Praetorium. And there's a little bit of controversy about this, but I want to show you something absolutely astonishing because I'm trying to tell you that every detail is important. Um, it seems that when Pilate stayed in Jerusalem, he stayed in the palace of Herod the Great. Now you might expect Herod's sons, Antipas, for example, was in Jerusalem at the same time. And they belonged to the dynasty of the Hasmoneans, but they didn't stay in the house of Herod the Great. That had been left unused after the death of King Herod. Uh, and they had their other temporary uh, dwelling in Jerusalem whenever they needed to visit there. And so they were living in a house whenever they stayed in Jerusalem, quite close to the Antonia Fortress, which looked down over the temple. And so when Jesus had to go from Pilate to Herod, back to Pilate, he was going a very short distance, very short. But I'm going to try and show you uh, um, now that when they took Jesus to uh, scourge him and to crown him with thorns, he was mocked as the King of the Jews in the palace of Herod the king. That's a fantastic detail. So I want to, to uh, bring you to that. But just to remind you, because I've told you that as we go through the Passion, we've got to revise the whole gospel to keep the gospel alive, to make sure that you hear all the issues uh, that are being brought up here um, in the Passion. And one of these issues is that everybody Jew or Gentile who meets Jesus of Nazareth has got to make a decision for or against him. And we've been watching this as we're going through the, the gospel. So a tiny little reminder will help because I want to show you where this goes. Back in chapter 11, we found that John the Baptist uh, was between yes and no. He wasn't absolutely sure. Are you the Messiah or aren't you? and Jesus had to give him more help in order to make his decision. And then John the Baptist goes over to the yes side, that Jesus is the Messiah, uh, and that he sends all his disciples to become Jesus' disciples. Um, then we found that the vacillating crowds sit on the fence all the time. They'll say yes if the Pharisees and scribes are not around. They'll say, no, they'll say nothing if the scribes and Pharisees are around because they play to the gallery. Whoever seems to be winning, they go with that. And that's a very dangerous position for anyone to be in, not to make a decision. You can't actually walk your whole of your life on a fence. You can't do that, uh, moving to this side and then moving to that side. That problem was challenged back at the time of Elijah in the uh, ninth century. Uh, when Elijah told them to stop hobbling from one foot to another, that you'll do this if it suits you and you'll do that if it suits you. You'll go to the Lord if it suits you and you'll go to the idols if it suits you. That exact problem is with us in society today, that many people who should belong to Jesus are in fact going towards new age or some 
uh, strange ideas that are coming in. Instead of being totally with the Lord, they're going to and fro. Now, that's a very bad position to be in spiritually because in a crisis, you can be pushed one way or the other, depending on who can work the crowd best. So then we had the chief priests and the Sanhedrin who were on the no side all the time. And their no was getting deeper and deeper as you came towards the passion. And because the crowds are vacillating, they decide to work the crowds. Now, Matthew doesn't go into all the details of all the accusations they made against Jesus. You have to find some of them in Luke and Mark, for example. And one of the accusations was that he was inciting the crowds. It's precisely what they do on Good Friday. They incite the crowds. Pilate can see what's going on. Um, and so we have this toing and froing. Now, Pilate gets the message that this man in front of him is no criminal. He knows what criminals are like and how they behave and how they talk and everything. And so he realizes that the chief priests have actually dumped their problem onto him and he's not having it, thank you very much. He wants to get rid of it. Now he's neither for nor against Jesus. That's Pilate's problem. Because if you're neither for or against, you can be shifted around and the chief priests know how to manipulate Pilate unbelievably. And so you get this very terrifying, twisted um, battle going on between them, which is partly religious, which Pilate doesn't understand. It's partly political, which Pilate does understand and knows that it's not actually involved in the case. Uh, but they learn how to manipulate him politically to do what they want. And so the chief priests actually show themselves in the passion of Jesus as the sinners they're accusing him of. Jesus all the time is pasted by other people's sins. He is accused of what other people do, and it's actually quite frightening. So Pilate decides that the only way he can get revenge on the chief priests is by forcing them to take responsibility for the death of Jesus. That's the only card he can play. And so he plays it, and he plays it quite well. Um, and so when they shout for the death of Jesus, they say, mm, so what do you want me to do with the King of the Jews? I mean, do you really want me to do this with the Messiah? But this is fascinating. It's fascinating if you've read the entire gospel. It's not fascinating if you only read this and you don't know what's behind it. Because Pilate is throwing back at them the real issues. Jesus is the Messiah. He is the King of the Jews. And Pilate said, what do you want me to do with him? Because he knows that it's not, his, uh, that it's not him in his position of authority. They're merely using him because they can't do it. They actually use Judas as well. It's really sad. The corruption of the best is the worst. And so Pilate forces them. And then Matthew tells us something very, very terrible. Pilate knew it was out of jealousy that they handed him over. And so he sat on the chair of judgment. And just as he was about to give judgment about Jesus, something absolutely brilliant happens. And we read this and we pass over it and we pay no attention to it. A Gentile pleads for the life of Jesus of Nazareth. Not only was the person a Gentile, she was a woman. And she was the only woman who would have any influence over Pilate. It was his wife. But we happen to know from uh, tradition and we happen to know from the revelation that Jesus gave to uh, the mystics of the 20th century that this woman was a believer in Jesus. And not only, uh, not only Procula, but there was a whole group of Roman ladies as well of the higher classes who believed in Jesus. And we're told that she had a dream about him that really disturbed her. Now, in Matthew's Gospel, you have to remember that Joseph had a dream about Jesus, and that's what made him take Mary home uh, as his wife. 
and enter into the whole mystery of Jesus. We're told that the Magi had a dream about Jesus and they obeyed what the direction that God has given to them. So it's in that context you read about this woman's dream. The Lord is revealing himself to her as well. And she tells her husband, don't touch that holy man. Now, that's terribly important for what he does next. Pilate knows that all his suspicions have been underlined, all of them. So don't touch, what does he do? He washes his hands. That's very important. And it's after this gesture. Um, so throughout the gospel, Matthew has been underlining the fact that the, the uh, chosen people have rejected their Messiah, they have rejected their Savior, they have rejected the King of the Jews, and the Gentiles were in favor all the time. And here you have another Gentile moving in. Now it's actually a, a, a wonderful moment that it is a Gentile woman as well, not because of feminism or anything like that, but because at the time, women had no value whatsoever. Certainly uh, among the Jewish people, they were on the, the lowest level uh, of society and their opinion wouldn't have been taken. But Pilate, actually came from a, an ordinary family, working class family himself, but somehow managed to marry a woman of high rank. And Procula was from the high ranking Romans. And so she had real clout in this marriage. If Pilate ever divorced his wife, he would be nothing in the Roman uh, setup. It was because of her that he had whatever privileges he had. So this particular woman to give that direction is very important. Pilate would listen. And so the washing of the hands coming immediately afterwards is terribly important. And this is what uh, Matthew says. Uh, now, as he was already seated on the chair of judgment, his wife sent him a message saying, have nothing to do with that holy man. I've been upset all day by a dream I had about him. And then while this, is, this interruption is going on, Matthew says, outside, the chief priests and the elders, however, had persuaded the crowd to demand the death of Jesus. Okay? They are sinning against their own law. They're sinning against the will of God. They're doing the very things that they've accused Jesus of doing. And the Sanhedrin has a desperate need to take the guilt off their own shoulders and paste it onto somebody else. So what they do is they work the crowd so that um, Matthew says in verse 26 that the crowd to a man shouted for Jesus' death. So what they do is they work the crowd to the point where they get complete unanimity among the chosen people to say no to their Messiah, to say no to the Son of God. Now, as we were doing the gospel all the way through, I've shown you the consequences that that will uh, bring upon themselves. It's actually very serious. Um, but there's a very important point here. When the chief priests succeed in getting the people to one man in complete uh, uh, unity, shouting for the death of Jesus, they have taken revenge on Jesus for the fact that these people shouted Hosanna to the son of David only five days previously. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, they've taken complete revenge on him. And this is done in public because the acclamation of Jesus on his entry into Jerusalem was public, but it was spontaneous and it was from the heart and it was where the people really understood that the truth was. What they're shouting now is not from the heart. 
it's because they have been whipped up into this position and it is hatred that's whipping them up. So what we're looking at here is a huge contest between hatred and love. We have to understand it's between life and death. It's between God and Satan. And all the people involved are just on one side or the other. And the, the strange thing is that human beings can get involved in a crisis like this and actually not know what they were doing. You're going to hear Jesus say that from the cross. Father, they don't realize what they're doing. And I would imagine that most of the laity uh, who shouted for his death didn't actually um, know what they were doing. They just didn't understand the, the issues at all. But now the chief priests have got their revenge on Jesus. Um, and in one sense, they're happy. Very brief happiness. It's kind of the satisfaction that you've, you've really got even, you know. It's not the kind of happiness that is worthwhile, that it's interior. But they illustrate something that Jesus said about them in Matthew 23, 16. They are blind guides. And if the blind guides lead anybody, particularly if they're blind as well, they will both end up in the ditch. And so they actually lead the people into a terrifying decision against the Lord. It's really, really serious. So. While this is going on, this is what Matthew says. The chief priests and the elders, however, had persuaded the crowd, in modern language that is, worked the crowd, okay, to demand the release of Barabbas and the execution of Jesus. So when the governor uh, spoke to them, he said, which of the two do you actually want me to, to release? He couldn't believe it. Barabbas was one of the most notorious criminals in his jail. And even a man like Pilate couldn't believe it because this was complete insanity. You don't release a notorious, violent person back into society. Aren't you going to have huge problems? We lock them up to try and save people. So even Pilate couldn't take it. So he realized there was a terrifying hatred behind this. Um, and so in the end, they all shouted, let him be crucified. And Pilate said, why? Pilate knew Rome would never, ever crucify a Roman citizen, ever. It was too humiliating. It was too nauseating even to look at. They wouldn't even do it to their worst criminals. And here were the Jewish people asking him to do the very thing that they considered utterly and completely revolting. Because a crucifixion was how to break a man down step by step until he reached the animal level. That's what it was about, destroying a person, not just killing them. Yeah, you killed them, but that wasn't the point. The, the point was you destroyed them. And we have heard from chapter 12 that the Sanhedrin had made up their minds they wanted to destroy Jesus. He had to be destroyed in the eyes of the people so that he would have no followers. They, they wanted to stop this thing altogether. In other words, they're totally blocking the will of God, totally. And we saw Jesus agonize in the garden until every Every part of his being agreed, thy will be done, not mine. Thy will be done, not mine, at any cost to himself. And so you're looking at the new and eternal high priest, and you're looking at the old priesthood, completely degenerate, completely corrupted. Sad. When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, he then decided to do an action which was very Jewish. That's the incredible thing. I just don't understand why he would do a very Jewish action, which is to wash your hands. In the book of Deuteronomy in chapter 21, verses one to nine, you get instruction that if an innocent person has been killed, that the people who know about it and could be suspected of the killing have to kill an animal 
uh, to offer a sacrifice to God and they have to wash their hands over this animal that will be offered to God, declaring their innocence. But when you read about this uh, in the, the Psalms and elsewhere in scripture, there's also another aspect to it as well. And that is the washing of the hands says, forgive me for anything I've done to bring this about. Pilate's wife has put that element into Pilate that he wants forgiveness for killing an innocent man. Look at Psalm 26 verse 6. I wash my hands in innocence so that I can join the Lord's procession to the altar. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 16 said to his people, your hands are covered in blood. You need to come back to the Lord and wash your hands and become clean in his sight. So Pilate washing his hands is not an empty gesture. It's a very powerful gesture. And in this gesture, first of all, he's asking the God he doesn't know or understand to somehow forgive him for being involved in this. That's his wife's influence. That's fantastic for me. The other thing is he's saying to the Jewish people, this is your concern. This is your problem. You brought this man to me. He's not guilty of anything. You want him dead. You take responsibility. So he's throwing it all back into their court completely. And so uh, Pilate does not want to sign his name to this death at all. But he's not strong enough to stop it. If he was a strong leader, he would have sent them home. He would have sent them packing. He wouldn't have dealt with it at all. Uh, and he would have set Jesus free. But of course, it wasn't part of the whole mystery of the Passover that the victim would be set free. So the, the weak political leader and the hateful priesthood and the betraying disciple was all part of this horrifying mystery, an unbelievable mystery. And so, um, he said, I am innocent of this man's blood. He said, it's your concern. You have to take responsibility. And at that point, the most horrendous thing that ever happened in Israel happened. And I'll read it for you. To a man, the people cried back, his blood be upon us and on our children. They brought down this most terrifying malediction upon themselves. And from that moment, their history was written in blood. Why would you do that to your children? It's one thing for you to take responsibility for something yourself, but you don't pass it on to the other generations. Now, the thing I have to say to you just to round this up, you'll remember that Jesus told them uh, uh, in chapter 24, that this generation was going to actually experience a terrifying chastisement from God, which would be the death of the temple, the death of the city, and finally the death of the nation. He just didn't tell them they would bring it on themselves. Heaven, earth, and hell were all listening. Very interesting, but sad. And so, we are the author of our own problems. When chastisement comes down upon us from God, it's our sins that have gone up to God demanding the chastisement. If only we would uh, learn the lesson from Jesus that we would surrender to God's will, we would have heaven on earth, not hell on earth. What you're looking at here in the passion of Jesus in Jerusalem is what hell on earth actually looks like. Thank you for listening. Slán agus bánach dé liv. Goodbye. God bless you. The work of Shalom is an essential part and a powerful part of the work of evangelization, of promoting the objective of sharing the good news of the gospel the joy of the good news of the gospel and its promise of salvation in this life and beyond death in the new life of the risen Lord. Its evangelization of culture and civilization is a most important objective 
for the people of God and the church right around the world. In this 21st century, when the human family is battered by so many forces of change, of uncertainty, forces which seem to threaten and menace hope, the hope of the risen Christ and of the good news of the gospel is something which has to be shared not only between individuals, but with communities of peoples right around the nations of God's earth. May the Lord bestow his blessing on the work of Shalom, on all who are, so who are associated with it, and also indeed on all those who through their charity and kindness support its most important work.